This unit, we're going to be going back through every single concept and lending it more detail, more formality. I remember being told that an engineer's job is to fix things and that a mathematician's job is to break things. So what I'm gonna be looking for you all to have in this unit is a mindset of trying to break the definitions and the concepts that we spent unit one establishing, right? So for example, today we're gonna to be talking about limits. Limits are things that you already know. You've already been playing with them for a while. We're now gonna show that that idea is not as simple as we think it is and that we need to lend more detail, more complexity, and consider more scenarios than the simple ones that I showed you in unit one. Because only by trying to break and challenge those definitions will we be at a place of understanding them truly. And then we'll be ready to apply it to the real world. Okay. Any questions on anything before we jump in? All right, jump on in this. So let's recall how we defined limits. We started off with an intuitive process, and then we started to make that more formal. So I started to get you comfortable with that idea in unit one. And keep in mind, this is not just something that we're doing in this class. This is something that we do in life in general, right? Would anybody have described the sun as rising this morning? Right? Did the sun rise this morning? But if I asked you actually to challenge that, did the sun do anything or did we just turn to look at it? Like the planet rotates, right? Did the sun rise or did we rotate to look at it and it was there the whole time? You see how like we have language that we use that makes sense to us from our perspective, our limited understanding, and then we begin to evolve that more and more, right? Are the seasons really changing or are we just simply getting warmer or cooler based on how we are facing the sun? Right, like it's, it's a change. There's a deeper understanding into the why things are happening, not just the what things are happening. So when we talked about limits here, for example, we said that an expression has a limiting value or a limit if it forever approaches the number. That is the concept. Like if you want a very simple concept for limits, a simple definition to start the conversation from, this is it. It's what do I forever approach? And you're allowed to think of it that way. You're just not allowed to write it. Because in that sentence, we have difficulties, right? Like, here's a problem. Sometimes we approach two different things from an expression. Like, if I said the limit as x approaches infinity of plus or minus the square root of x, let's run that off for bigger and bigger x values. We'll plug in 100, plug in 1,000, plug in 10,000. Then what I get at every single moment is a plus or minus answer. So which one does it approach? Do I say both? Do I say neither? We need to look out for these gotcha situations. So we decided, okay, let's go ahead and specify that it's not just about the things that I approach, it's about a single value that I approach. Single value. So that's the big first takeaway from limits. We're talking about one thing I approach. You can't approach two. So then we take a second attempt at trying to redefine this thing. We say an expression has a limiting value or a limit if it forever approaches a single number. Good. The difficulty with that, though, is what does it mean to forever approach? By this point, we should recognize that saying words like forever is about as descriptive as saying words like infinity. It doesn't mean anything. How do you prove that? How do you say, I approach this at forever, if forever is a process you don't end? But you can't prove this rigorously. So it has a good idea to it, but words like forever are only good in conversation. They are not good as formal proof. So we need to find a different way of being able to adjust this. So we say, okay, instead, we're going to say that I have a limit if there is a sequence, a list of data that can get arbitrarily close to it. In other words, we phrase this entire thing like an argument. We say 0.9 repeating is one because it couldn't be anything else, right? If you said it was anything else, I could show that it gets away from that. 
versus if I say it is equal to one, then no matter how close you want to be to one before you believe me, I can find a point in my data in which after that, I am within that distance, right? So if you say that I need to be, let's say within one ten thousandth of one for you to believe me, then I can go across the 0.9 repeating until I cut it off at a certain point and say, look, all of that extra detail just makes me even closer than what you wanted. Right? And you can say, okay, never mind, that was too easy. I want you to be within one billionth of one. And I'd say, great, I can go along that list. I can find a certain point where I cut it and say, all the details afterwards just get me within that margin. And because I can do that logically every single time, we have to agree that the limit is one because I can always find a cutoff point in my sequence and say, beyond that, I have met your criteria. That's how we prove the forever approach. We don't try to get at forever. We just try to say forever approach means at a certain point, I can always be made indistinguishable because no matter what difference you think there is, I can always show you I have less. It's by phrasing as an argument. It's by trying to prove the not instead of trying to touch it directly. So let me pause here for a moment. Those are kind of the three big topics of limits that we've got to keep in mind because we're going to challenge and explore each of those through different scenarios. Does anybody have any questions about these details? Yeah, go ahead. So here's our formal definition based on that conversation. Yes, it's a little bit complex. Yes, we're going to make it really complex on Friday when we really challenge it. But for the most part, it should just reinforce the conversation we just had. The limit of a sequence exists. It's not saying it always exists, by the way. It's saying if it exists, then it must meet these criteria. The limit of a sequence exists if a number in the sequence or in the sequence can always be found such that afterwards, all numbers are within a desired distance, we call that epsilon, from L. In other words, if we say I have a asymptote at negative two as X runs off to infinity, then that means there's a certain point in the graph where I can cut it and say everything bigger than that in terms of X values is close, whatever you call close, enough to two that you will believe me, excuse me, to negative two that you will believe me. You can think about it like this. So the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to negative two. Why? Because I can find a certain point in this graph where I just cut it, where I just cut it. And all of this over here is close enough. And what if you all say, well, how big is close enough? I say, what do you want close enough to be? And you could say, it needs to be within a million. Then I say, good, I can find a place to cut it that will match that. And you can say, no, I need it to be within 10 million. So I'll be like, good, I can find a place to cut that. And we have a debate back and forth until you go, oh, I get it. No matter what number I give you, you can just find a place to cut that and it will be true. And I'm like, yeah, that's the point. That means that I get forever close because I could, for I could always cut this graph close enough to satisfy anyone's need, even if that need is going to get progressively smaller. All right, we feeling all right? It's a very tricky way. Do you all notice like it's this play between saying I can't touch it exactly, so I just got to talk about being close enough in a forever loop that says I will always be close enough, forever close enough. <laughs> it's a very tricky way. Okay, so let's just remind ourselves of some easy examples, right? If we're talking about the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared, then regardless of the approach in this table, we might have the guess that the limit value is going to be 4, right? So we get a, a list, a sequence of x values that get close to 2. 
then I look get a sequence of values that are the x squared that correspond with those. So I started with a, a sequence. I transformed that into the sequence I care about, right? So I start with a sequence of inputs. I looked at the sequence of x squares. The x squares look like they're getting pretty close. And I look at the other direction and see that they get pretty close as well. So a table is limited because I only have the data in front of me, which is why I'm not going to say it is four. I'm just going to say probably it's a pretty good guess that it's four, right? Pretty good guess based on the table. But there's no ability to confirm the forever here because I'm locked into specific values. Instead, I'd have to go reaching for algebra. If I start reaching for algebra and expanding the table, imagining more parts of the table, then I can start to lock it down with a story of logic. Also notice it doesn't depend on the table I choose. It doesn't depend on the table I choose. Like this table here has different X values, but they still get close to two. And if I look at their X squared values, they continue to get close to four. So this satisfies that definition, that definition of saying, I just need to get a consideration of all ways I can get close. Look if I have a settling point. If I can argue that there's a settling point, then I argue there's a limit. Again, let me check in. How are we doing here? Give me, give me a thumbs up or a thumb sideways. Where are we at? We're doing okay. Okay, cool. Graphically, can we do this graphically? Yes, absolutely. We were just playing with that before, right? Graphically, we have the ability to kind of look at much more of those forever amounts. I don't have to look at specific data points. I can look at trends. And we can say, again, like, does it make sense that as the X values come in towards two, the y values come in towards four. All right, does that look good? So it's like if I if you ever said like, oh, I need to get closer to two, I'd be like, good, then you're gonna get closer to four. And you say, well, how are you gonna get forever close to four? And I'd say by getting as close as you want to two. I can make it happen. I can make it work where I will always be close enough to any criteria. And so we say, now the best thing that this graph suggests is that there is a limit at four. So to confirm all of that, then we reach for algebra and symbolics and we begin to show it through our notation. We say the limit as X approaches two of X squared, backed up by all the logic that we just talked about, tells us that I can get the limit by just simply plugging into and that gets me four. This is going to be the challenge of this unit. Many of you are going to look at this and say, okay, so I can just plug it in. And I'm going to say, no, we just had a whole 20 minute conversation about the logic that has to happen behind the scenes in order to justify plugging it in. You've got to have that logic. Cause like we said, we're about to break it. There's gonna be times where plugging it in gives us the wrong answer and we'll see why. Right? You've got to start it from the story. Do not start it from the symbols on paper. Okay. So let's try to break it, shall we? Here's a graph where I have a hole in it. You all have explored holes when we were talking about algebra. We've also explored how I can use piecewise functions to sometimes fill the holes and make a whole bunch of crazy, different, complicated looking things. Like, for example, this one here might be something like uh, log of x, what would that be, plus 5, so long as x is not equal to 2, and then if x is equal to 2, like this could be a pretty loose model for the graph that I have up here. Right, It's a piecewise function that says I follow this arcing trend most of the time, unless I'm at x equals 2, in which case I have a height of 2. And that's where I get that kind of fill in dot. So we've got piecewise functions that can model this. But let's not worry too much about the piecewise yet. Let's just worry a little bit about what the picture says. So if I'm looking at this idea here of f of 2, somebody tell me what this means. No trick questions yet. I'm just starting from music. Go ahead. That means x equals 2, and I want to consider what? 
I want to look at the y value, right? It says, what's the y value if x is 2? That's all it says. This is an algebra statement, right? This is algebra. At this point, this is just algebra. So how do I handle it? I do the logic of algebra. I go over to an x value of 2, which is right here. And then I go up until I hit in a y value for it. What's the y value going to be? 2. Does it matter that there's a hole there? Not at all, right? This story did, like, did not look at the arc. This story did not look at anything except for just what am I above two? So we did, I am two above two. Got it. All right. Somebody give me the sentence structure of that second bullet point. What's that one say? Go ahead, Mikhail. Good. First, before you get too far into that, translate that into like meaningful words for you. What does that mean? Like if you're explaining it to me. As we approach two, where? As we get forever close to two, where? Where on the graph? Vertically? Okay. I don't think that's where X is, though. Take a step, Andrew. As X approaches two. So as X approaches two. So that's going to be where on the graph? Um, horizontally, right? So I'm just looking horizontally. So this one now says, okay, I've got a brand new story. So I'm going to erase all my work. This now says that as I am getting close to two on the X axis, I need to make a list, right? Sequence. This has a limit. So I need a sequence. So I need to be considering... X value, 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 X value. I need to be considering list, list of things. Then what do I do with that list? You want to keep going? What is the Y values approach? Okay, then that means I need to take each of these and I need to fit bring them up. So that now. I am looking at, that was the first Y value. That's the next Y value. Next, 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 next. And these ones here I'm bringing up. So that I get this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. So that means that this is coming up as I go through the list. And this one's going down as I come through the list. So the question is, what is the limit? Four, right? I can make a table just like that, where I take each of those X values and I look at all of those Y values and I look at how the Y values are trending. This thing is going to be four. So what we begin to notice is that algebra is the story of is. I've mentioned that a few times. Algebra is is. What is the dot? Like, where is the dot? What is the height here, right? Limits is a story of approach. So you can sort of think of it like we're tracking along this curve and we're just trying to figure out what am I approaching? Here's one of my favorite examples that contrasts the two different methods of thought. Anybody here ever uh, go down a flight of stairs in the middle of the night and then trip when you think there's one more stair and there's not? Like anybody do that? They like go down, they stumble on the bottom step. They're like, oh, that, that's, a, that's a floor, right? What's happening there? What's happening there is you've got two parts of your brain that are both doing good logic and coming to completely different answers. One part of your brain is going, I was on a stair. This is a stair. The next thing should be a stair. And the other part of your brain is going, damn, that's a floor. Right? So what we have is we have a conflict. We've got one, which is the is. What is it? It's a floor. What did I think it was going to be? A stair. Were either of those wrong? No, they were just different questions. One was, what did you expect? The other one is, what is? Both are logical. They're just different questions. All right, let's do this one here. Somebody else tell me what that says. What was it? The height at zero, right? Am I going to look nearby zero? Didn't say anything about that. Right above zero. So I look at the height right above zero. Minhaz, what's the height right above zero? Two. 
That's my answer. Done. Logic of is. Algebra. Somebody give me the sentence for the next one. Good. As we consider x values that are getting forever close to zero, right, what are their corresponding height values squeezing in towards? So we ask, okay, as I'm getting close to zero, maybe I can track that along the graph here. As I'm getting close to zero from both one direction and the other direction, what is the height that it's squeezing in on? There's a lot more people in here than just because. Help me out, y'all. It's squeezing in towards two. Notice that that means that in one scenario, I had a limit that was different than my actual. And on the other, I had a limit that was my actual. Because sometimes if I walk on stairs in the middle of the night, I will expect there to be a stair and there will be a stair, right? Other times I will think there is going to be a stair and there is a floor. That is okay. Sometimes our expectations don't match the actual what we get. Sometimes they do. This is just a playing between that logic. Good. Any questions before I move on? Let's take a look at this one. This is a really good example, right? Really good example. Because in the last one, what we found was a way of violating the ability to plug in is that we can't plug in if I have a discontinuity. We'll talk more about that concept next class. But like the problem with the first example and the second example is the first example had a hole, right? The first example had a hole. So if I actually tried to plug into the graph, I couldn't plug in to the same thing I was trending towards. There wasn't, a, there wasn't anything there. There was a hole. Versus in the second example, I could plug in and get the same thing I was trending towards because I didn't have a hole. So sometimes when I have an interruption in my graph, an interruption in my behavior, that will prevent us to be able to plug in. Here's another situation. Let's again, let's think through this in the same way that we've been developing. We can always start with that logic of the method of exhaustion. We can just try some numbers, right? Or we can look at a graph. We can try to get an idea of the behavior. The difficulty with this one is that if we graph this function, it becomes very difficult to figure out what is happening at zero, right? That's x equals zero. What's my height there? It's a complete blur, right? And in truth, even if you zoom into this, it continues with the same behavior. The graph does not specify as you get in further and further because we can start to look at this and understand the trend. Right? Remember again that sine is going back to the unit circle. And so that if I talk about taking like pi and I divide it by a decimal, like pi divided by 0.1, that would be 10 pi after you simplify that, right? Sine of pi divided by 0.1, same thing as sine of 10 times pi. Right, because 0.1 is 1 tenth, and dividing by a tenth is the same thing as multiplying by 10. So what that means is that as you're getting closer and closer to zero, this thing is skyrocketing between 10 pi, and then you go over a tenth, it's going to be at 20 pi, 30 pi. It only takes me 2 pi to go around the unit circle, and I've just jumped by 10 every time I've moved in a little bit. You start making the increments of hundredths or thousandths, and I'm spinning around that unit circle like crazy, which means that I'm fluctuating between the extremes of what sign can get me. So that's why it becomes very difficult. In fact, it becomes impossible to figure out what's happening at zero because there's no trend. As you get closer, you start to spin more frantically around the unit circle. And so there's no easy settling point to determine. We can do a table. Let's do a table as a chance to practice. I'm going to need calculators out. We're going to need to play with some of these. All right, let's get a show of hands for people who have calculators. All right, I'm going to have you start with the negative half. I'm going to have you start with the negative quarter. Can we see those hands up still? Negative eighth. Let's go ahead and have you do positive eighth. Let's go ahead and have you do one fourth, and we'll have you do all the way in the back picture. Let's do a half. 
Everybody else, you can go ahead and confirm any answers that you want up there just as a way of participating. Remember that if you're plugging in a fraction, you're plugging it in on the denominator. So it's divided by a half. It's not times a half, right? Sine of pi divided by a half. Use parentheses. Make sure that you're grouping it all in together. For everybody else, you're also welcome to try this as a bit of a algebra or trig refresh, right? Because this should come out as nice round numbers and you should be able to have your unit circle in the back of your head to confirm these answers with. Mm, I think it should be simpler than that. Because negative one eighth would be pi divided by negative one eighth would be negative eight pi. And negative eight pi should be a nice clean number on the unit circle. Yeah, modes, make sure that we're in radians, right? Good. When x equals one eighth, zero. 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 All right, excellent. So now let's take a moment here. If I gave you this table, first, are the values getting arbitrarily close to zero? Are the x values getting arbitrarily close to zero? Right? If I kept this pattern going and said I divided by a 16th and then a 32nd and then a 64th, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would I be getting forever close to zero? We got one person nodding. Everybody else, where are we at? Yeah? Okay. So that means that I have the ability to continue this trend and approach. I've got a good approach. The heights are 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, all the way on down if I continue this pattern. So what's the limit? But by this table, we would want to think limit, right? It's zero. Remember that tables are not great ways of being able to actually pin it down. We need the algebra to pin it down. But we could say something like the limit as x approaches zero of this function appears to be zero, maybe, right? Squiggly equals, best information we got right now. We're still exploring, right? All right, watch what happens if I give you a different table. So again, let's do the same things. Let's go ahead and start it with negative two thirds, negative two sevenths, negative two elevenths. Uh, who else do we have? Two ninths, do two fifths, and then uh, yeah, Adam, go ahead and do two. One. One for two sevenths, or two fifths. One for two fifths. Get ones for the rest, right? What would we think is the limit here? One. So this is a place where we're noticing a break, right? If it just says get forever close to two, or sorry, get forever close to x equals zero, the how we do it, we never specify in our definition, right? We said it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't matter. I should just be able to get a list. Well, this method, it matters very much how I got my list. And depending on how I get my list, I'm either getting a whole bunch of peaks along this behavior, or I'm getting a bunch of zeros behind this behavior, or I could be getting a bunch of negative ones if I chose a different list, or I could be choosing anything in between if I just specifically grab those values. So let's check our definition. If I approach more than one thing, what is my limit? It does not exist. That's exactly right. This does not exist. There is no single settling point that we can determine for this function as I get close to x equals zero. There's just no settling point. We see that in the picture, right? There's no settling here. It's not settling at all. So let's not call anything a settling point. There's no settling point here. But we do notice that for, through this example, we've now got a few different times. We can't always just plug in, and we can't always just look at the graph, and we can't always just look at the table. We have to do a huge combination of all of those things and then look for the times when they violate the definition or when they match it. But limits are a little bit harder than just simply things get close. Of course they do. We'll plug it in. 
So how could we show this in our math? Well, we could say something like, since the sequence one divided by two n, right? That's the first one that we considered, one divided by two, four, eight, whatever. One divided by two n and two divided by four n plus one. That was how I got the second sequence can be made arbitrarily close to zero, then we need to conclude that this does not exist because sine of pi divided by one over two n equals sine of two n pi equals sine of n times two pi. Let's remind us again, uh, sine of two pi is zero, because I've gone around one full revolution of the circle. And if I go through another revolution of the circle, I'll be still at zero and zero and zero. And it doesn't matter if I've gone around how many complete revolutions. If I am back at the starting point, this is always zero. And sine of oh, pi divided by two divided by four and plus one equaled one, right? Because that's how we got from our second sequence. And zero does not equal one. Like we've got to get into the comfort of drawing and writing some sentences to explain this. Why is there no limit? Because I found an approach. It got me one answer. I found another equally valid approach. It got me a different answer. They are an example of how I am not approaching something as a single settling point, so the limit doesn't exist. Let me pause here for a moment. Any questions? Y'all starting to see that this class is going to become a little bit more about you making arguments for your work than just simply doing the work? That's 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 what we're leading it. That's this unit. This unit is you better be able to argue why it works, not just do it in front of me. Argue why it works. The why is everything. Cool. All right, we feel good. Let's do another example. Consider the following function. We got a piecewise function here, right? Piecewise function. Let's remind ourselves how we read the piecewise function. H of t, that's the function, that's the height, right, is going to be negative 1 if t is less than or equal to negative 2. The height is going to be 2 if t is greater than or equal to negative 2. In other words, you want to start reading this as a story, right? My height is negative 1 sometimes, and my height is 2 other times. What are those times? Well, we've got a cutoff point that it looks like below negative 2 and then including and above negative 2. Right, so we've got we've got a description here. It's a story, useful, super useful way of modeling the real world. Right, for those of you who are trying to get into modeling and using math in the real world, engineers, computer scientists, biologists, chemists, all of that, like piecewise functions. Piecewise functions are it. Anybody remember at the beginning of the pandemic when people were talking about flattening the curve? I remember like the whole idea of like wear masks and get back to like flatten the curve. It was this before vaccines, like it was, it was like flatten the curve because like it was skyrocketing too quickly. Think about that from a mathematical perspective. That's an incorrect statement. We all knew that the virus was spreading exponentially, right? An exponential graph has that shape. How do you flatten that? But we did, like, we, like it obviously peaked and came down, and we have plenty of models that show that. So what did we do? What we were saying is that we wanted to change and influence the behavior until the transformation stopped being exponential and started to be something else, right? So what we were saying is that there's a certain point where we were trying to cut this behavior and replace the curve with a different curve, something that would allow it to come down in terms of infection rates. So that's an example of a piecewise function in the real world. Tax systems is also a piecewise function in the real world, right? Where you make a certain amount of money, you pay a certain tax rate, and then you make a certain other amount of money, you make a different tax rate. Like modeling is mostly done through piecewise functions. All right, so what would be, if we wanted to look here, the limit 
as x approaches negative 2 of h of t. I guess it should be t approaches negative 2. What would that be? Make an argument for it. What do you got, Mikhail? Uh, oh, you got it? You always got to have it because. Because you have um, two loop answers. Um, right Very here. good. So what we want to say is does not exist because as x approaches negative 2 from the right, h of t approaches 2. But as x approaches negative 2 from the left, h of t approaches negative 1. Since 2 does not equal negative 1, the limit does not exist. And we make an argument. Yeah. Um, so during our quiz, did you pass here in a one? Yes, uh, absolutely I will. Yes, I will. So notice that we're going to have some notation here. I've still got you all for a minute. Come on, we can do plenty in a minute. We're going to introduce some notation. Instead of saying x approaches negative 2 from the right, I'm going to write x approaches negative 2 superscript negative. X approaches negative two from the right. Sorry, that'd be from the positive. X approaches negative two from the positive. X approaches negative two from the negative. So for example, let's jump to this one right here. This is a story. The limit as X approaches negative two from the... From the negative, that'd be what side? From the left, as I approach it from the left. So I'm going to look at X equals six, here I am. I'm going to consider as I approach it from only the left, that means I'm tracking only this way, what's the limit going to be? Uh, five. five. You see how it's important that you bring it down to its story. Do not look at it just for the symbols in front of your eyes. Make sure you're translating it into a story. Eventually, you'll be able to decode it in real time, and that's when you're ready for the quizzes and tests. If you have any questions, stick around. Otherwise, you're all good to go.